So all you have to do is get connected. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, just one interesting aspect. You may or may not find it so. Uh, I was born in Boca Raton, but I was also born in what is now the FAU campus. <laughs> so you can do the math. My father was stationed there uh, during World War II. And when I went back to get my degree in mechanical engineering, supposedly, rumor has it that uh, I actually took my classwork in the same building where he was a captain and was in charge of radar instruction. So <clears throat> little known, now it's more than little known fact. Um, let me, uh, I've got a number of slides and uh, hopefully you can see them all, but I'm gonna not read them. I hate reading slides. I hate, I wanna point out the salient points but from these, I, I want to ground us to begin with. And what I want to ground us with is um, really what is ocean marine renewable energy? What are the forms of ocean energy? And basically, they're wind or the wave tidal, ocean current, and ocean thermal energy conversion. And that's taking the differential of warm surface water, very cold uh, water at whatever depth it is and using uh, a heat exchanger process, if you think of it that way, uh, to convert that into a fluid that then runs a turbine. So there are four main forms of ocean energy. Uh, we at SENMEREC, or the Southeast National Marine Renewable Center, and FAU are focused on those that are, have the most potential for at, in this region, and those are the ocean current or the Gulf Stream, the forcing function, and also the potential for ocean thermal energy conversion. So those are the two that we're focusing on. Uh, we do use and collaborate with other organizations that are involved in the research because there is a translation of information and many of the same issues that they're dealing with in wave and tidal are the same ones that we need to concern ourselves with. So let me go through these. The other thing I think would be important to know is that it's not just what we're doing here in South Florida. Uh, we're focusing on the region and the regional so, uh, resource, but ocean renewable energy is actually being pursued around the globe. Uh, in the UK, up in Norway, Denmark, uh, the Netherlands, South Africa, Brazil, um, many of the countries in, uh, in the uh, Western European area, as well as Korea, Thailand, and Taiwan, uh, Korea, excuse me, Taiwan and, or, um, and uh, Japan are also looking at it. And so that there is a, a large community uh, addressing marine renewable energy as a, as a potential for um, taking us off the reliance on fossil fuel. And then why specifically uh, the Gulf Stream? That is a great resource. It runs 24-7. It's right off our coastline. Why not look into the feasibility and take advantage of that resource? And for the state of Florida, we're over 80% or around 80% reliant on fossil fuel. About 16% is nuclear and the rest is uh, renewables. So why not help us move off of the reliance on fossil fuel, and we import most of that. And that's billions of dollars out of the state, and if there's any interruption in that transport of, of resource in fossil fuel, then we have some issues in the state of Florida. Okay, we were established under the University uh, Centers of Excellence program back in 2007. We actually, at that point, transitioned in 2000 and. 10 to a center, a National Marine Renewable Energy Center by the U.S. Department of Energy, and we're one of three in the nation. Uh, the other two, one is in Hawaii, 
and they focus on OTEC or ocean thermal and wave energy. And then the other is in the northwest, and that's uh, a combination or a collaboration between Oregon State University and the University of Washington. And I know we have a speaker coming up next week from the University of Washington. So there is a, a lot of collaboration in the marine renewables and marine sciences area. So to move on, what are we really about? We really are about developing and assessing a research capability as well as a test and evaluation capability. We are not commercializing. Our technology that we've developed is really generic. It's not intended to be a design that the industry is going to adopt, but it's ensuring that we've taken a pathway to start testing and evaluating in the Gulf Stream with the, the least risk possible and feasible. We're also about understanding the resource potential. We're doing a lot of work, and I'll show you that in some subsequent slides. So how strong is that resource, the Gulf Stream, and how feasible is it to go out and extract energy from the Gulf Stream? Um, we're about environmental stewardship. So we need to understand the baseline environmental patterns. For example, what's the pattern or distribution of sea turtle migration? Sea turtles are endangered species. We need to understand what they do, where they go, how they get there, both as adults but also as hatchlings. We know a lot about the sea turtles along the coastline. We know virtually <coughs> nothing about their migratory patterns, where they go as hatchlings. We can tag adult sea turtles and figure that out, but we really can't do that with uh, the hatchlings, and so we need to look at other technologies to be able to follow those patterns and know where they're going relative to where we may site uh, an, an eventual commercial array, we being the larger industry community. Also, it's about system interdependencies. That means we have to look at both the technology, where it's operating, what are the systems that we need to understand, are we attracting or repelling fish, for example? Is that going to be species related? Do we have issues with acoustics? Is that going to be the forcing function for fish to be uh, attracted or repelled? Or is there something else in there? All of that goes into it, as well as the social aspects. The social aspects being policy, regulatory framework. Early stage technology capability, that's the test center. That's once we get the infrastructure out there, we'll be able to test those early designs and devices one design, single design, smaller scale for companies before they start looking at commercialization. An important step in maturing technology and reducing risk along the way. Energy extraction capacity. We don't know how much energy we're actually going to get out of the Gulf Stream. And once we get it, how much is actually going to make it to shore through transmission. So those are the longer term aspects that we need to look at from the center's perspective, but working collaboratively with national labs, with using models and simulations that are being developed across the community to understand that. And then what is that going to look like once we do develop energy or extract energy? How do we connect to shore? What's that model going to look like? Are the FPNLs and the progress energies going to build the infrastructure from the site of extraction or creation of energy out in the Gulf Stream to the site of connecting to a distribution center. All of those have to be figured out. And those models and those discussions are just starting now. And then uh, finally on this listing, and this is the last slide I'll read the listing from, um, <clears throat> is really developing the pro protocols, the procedures, the processes for operation in the environment, in the Gulf Stream. And that has to translate to setting up regulatory framework for companies when they eventually commercialize. What are the expectations from the environmental community for monitoring, ongoing monitoring and assessment of the environment and the ecosystem? And how do you bring those together? And so we're actually that stepchild, poster child, and developing those protocols 
and defining what they are. And um, the other thing, I'll bring you down, back down to where we are so you understand what we're talking about. This is the Florida current. Uh, there's a lot of action that goes in along in the Gulf of Mexico. There are loop currents, there's uh, eddy effects, but this is just to ground you on what we're talking about along the coast of Florida. At the same time, I spoke with you briefly about ocean thermal energy conversion. Ocean thermal energy uh, looks like it has really potential, almost equivalent in the, in the manner of extraction capability, not feasibility, but capability as marine hydrokinetic, which would be using the forcing func function of the Gulf Stream. Both of those, or either of those, if one of the questions keeps coming up, how much is actually realizable? We're still working on that. But for example, if you take about 5% of the potential of the ocean current, and that is 5% of about 200 gigawatts, and that's reasonably recoverable, you're talking about the equivalent of three nuclear power plants. I said turkey point in this <clears throat> earlier session, and somebody said, what's a turkey point? Well, that's a nuclear power plant south of Miami. Um, but you're really talking about significant potential of power. If that's, even if that's just what's realizable, 5%, that's an equivalent to three nuclear power plants or thereabouts. Okay, uh, this is just another um, example of the ocean current off of the coast of Florida. But this is uh, a depth chart, and these are in meters. What you're really talking about, um, and the redder or the pinker and the deeper red that you go, that's what the delta temperature feasibility is between the surface water and the depth. This, though, is much closer not much closer, but in shallower depths than what uh, Hawaii is doing in the way of looking at ocean thermal energy conversion. Now, the challenge is going to be not so much the depth, that will be one challenge, but now we've got a forcing function of a Gulf Stream. So you now add another challenge from a technical standpoint, technology standpoint, to factor into any design of an ocean thermal uh, facility. But there are some of the larger companies are looking at this as real potential, including some of the agencies such as the Navy and looking at OTEC as being a means of being able to get off uh, the reliance on uh, importing energy to a facility, a site. So it, it goes back to uh, energy security. All right, what are we really talking about as far as a deployment site? Right now, keep in mind that we're initially going to be a single anchored deployment. And what that means is we're not building out an array. We're not connecting to shore through a transmission line. We're about proving out the feasibility, developing our models, assessing the models, assessing the environment, to make sure we've got a clear picture of what those interdependencies are and how they're interacting. So we've got to go through all of these steps and all these interdependencies to really figure out what's going on. What I have portrayed here is a single mooring and telemetry buoy, which means that it's going to be a buoy out there. It's going to have a lot of instrumentation on it. It's going to be able to, through a whole mounted um, instrument, be able to start continue looking at uh, the strength of the Gulf Stream and the contour, as well as video equipment and other uh, oceanographic instruments to be able to assess what's going on in the environment, the resource, on a 24-7 basis. We have an application that has been um, submitted to the Department of Interior, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. This is for a lease. This is just one piece of the whole regulatory framework that has pretty much been driving how we laid out the program. And this is a, an area, regulatory network or framework, is so new 
that we've actually introduced players from different agencies to bring them to the table to start talking about how do they work together in developing that framework at a federal and state level. What the lease requirement is, is just for this little dot down here. It's for an anchor. So BOEM, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, is the lead agency, and they're the ones who will be providing a lease to FAU to go ahead and deploy the anchor. We've already done toast testing with this. We know how it operates. We've actually made modifications to it. This is the, our experimental turbine. It's a very generic turbine, very non, uh, it's technology agnostic. And then this is the vessel that will be, from which the turbine will be uh, um, slung off the back or craned off the back. Uh, there is a lot of wiring and instruments and as well as a, a transmission line to be able to take the energy to the vessel. But the, ves the energy is to be used to continue to uh, energize the data systems and the acquisition systems. And then the remaining energy will be dissipated as heat. This will be tethered out there one to two weeks at a time. It'll also be the facility by which we can then hang off other, uh, or hang off uh, companies' devices and start their testing and evaluation at small scale. This is intended to be out there one to two years, come back for uh, overhaul and maintenance, and be uh, resubmitted out there. And then we've made sure in our design that when we acoustically release this cable from the anchor, it will float up. And so therefore, keeping in consideration that we are not doing any damage to the seabed floor. OK, quickly, permitting. The minute you put the word energy into the language, the level of scrutiny, the level of expectation of the regulatory bodies, of the stakeholders, which are you in this audience, uh, they're permitting agencies, they're the fishers, they're all, we're all stakeholders in this. We all have a stake in what's being done, so we want to be heard. But the minute you put energy in there, all of a sudden I have to have permits, licenses, leases to do what would be standard oceanographic research. So hence, I've spent four years at the university now come the beginning of March. And since I got here, I've been working on how do we figure out this regulatory framework. Because remember, not only is marine renewable energy so new and nascent, so is the regulatory framework. We are making headway. And we've been meeting with a number of different individuals. I just was up in Washington yesterday, and I'm going back up tomorrow morning. And I was meeting with NOAA and the policy lead yesterday. On Friday, I'm meeting with the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, as well as a senior advisor in uh, environmental uh, EPA, uh, because they have a stake in the game. That me leads me into this chart. It's not complete, and I apologize. I'd love to move this around, but I can't. Uh, this is not complete. These are a number of the agencies at, at federal and state level who feel that they have a responsibility with their mission to weigh in into the discussion. And so everything from Department of Interior, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, NOAA and the Department of Defense, Homeland Security, that's with the Coast Guard, all the way down, and these are in no particular order, Department of Environmental Protection, uh, Fish and Wildlife Commi Commission, EA, EPA, et cetera. So you begin to get a sense of the enormity of what we're doing, the exposure of what we're doing, the visibility of what we're doing, and we have to have the answers and also the methodologies in place to be able to provide the answers to them. Um, this, if you think about it, this is marine spatial planning on a mini level. We, these are the aspects that we had to consider in putting together this lease application. And the lease application is for these three blocks, 27 square miles of area. 
And a question that came up earlier was, well, why don't you reduce the size of it? Because we have to have the flexibility as we do the survey work to find the best spot to put the initial anchor down, and then eventually uh, multiple anchors to start looking at what are the array effects or effects of placing turbines and how closely can you site them. So this is the area that is in question for the lease application. We had to look at areas that are restricted for the Navy, uh, submarine traffic, You've got shallow water submarine traffic, and then you have deep water submarine traffic. These yellow hash lines are pretty much vessel traffic, north-south direction. And you've got a lot of traffic that goes in here into the Port Everglades area. Cruise ships, container vessels, and then you've got the, the deeper water, the longer traveling uh, uh, container ships out here. We also have uh, sensitive areas for instrumentation and observation tests by the Department of Defense, mainly the Navy. We also have two areas of, of specific interest to Harbor Branch, and that's the Golden Crab and also Coral Habitat area of particular concern. And there's a lot of work ongoing in Harbor Branch, uh, specifically in these areas. But I mean, you can throw dots all over this for the fishers, the fishermen. So we've got to take all of these into context as we're developing this particular application. And this is the first national marine renewable energy application. So this is going to set the framework and the expectations for what companies are going to have to do and what agencies are looking for. This list of agencies are all in consultancy in this application process. And BOEM is actually uh, heading up and conducting an environmental assessment. So that's their skin in the game at this point. I want to show you this slide. Uh, this was work that was done in conjunction with a Department of Energy funding that came through, part of it through Florida Atlantic University. John Reed, I'm sure many of you know him. He was instrumental in being involved with doing the survey work to start to set up protocols and a model for companies to use in being able to do survey work for marine renewable energy. What is it going to take? What are the process and procedures that need to be um, followed in doing work in getting ready to site areas for marine renewable energy? Uh, they were able to you look at this along with some other work that he's doing right now with the Navy and integrating that information to give a bigger picture. What you notice here, here are the three red blocks. But if you notice here, there's more of a, a rough area and an escarpment. That information is important because that's an area that we're staying away from, even though it's got the strength of the Gulf Stream, the, what we call the fire hose of the Gulf Stream there because this is a great area for habitation for coral and marine life. So obviously that's an area we want to stay away from. This seems to be more conducive to the work that we're doing in these two areas as well as this, and we're starting off with this block as our first deployment site. That's at about 80% strength of what you would see over here as far as the ocean current is concerned, but it gives us that opportunity to crawl before we walk and before we run. Um, so this is the latest information. As a matter of fact, that report should be going out and will be released by DOE sometime this late this spring, early summer. And just to ground you a little bit further, uh, BOEM is expecting to finish a draft EEA in the next week or so. I'm meeting with them Friday. Uh, that draft EA will be put out through the Federal Register uh, for public comment. And then it'll be a 30-day public comment, as well as their planning to uh, conduct a stakeholder engagement meeting to talk about the project. That'll be somewhere around the Fort Lauderdale area, but I'll see if there's a means and I'll touch base with Dennis to see if we can get that um, videoed up 
to Harbor Branch if you're interested. Okay, and that is intended to be somewhere uh, around the third week in February. From this, we hope that we will actually have a lease that will be a um, signed lease late spring. It's probably going to be more very late spring, June time frame. And that will have, what we'll, it will have in the lease are the stipulations that the environment, uh, the industry, the large industry will have to look at as they're going further and moving forward in commercialization, as well as the stipulations that we will have. They may be we need to do more surveys of the coral habitat. We need to do uh, more work in the area of uh, fish, uh, understanding fish and how they're going to be attracted or repelled. We don't know what they're yet. And so, like I said, this is the first lease and application. I mentioned this. These are the three big concentric circles that have cause and effect, both the technology, the environment and ecosystem, and then the social aspects, including uh, in that are the educational opportunities. Okay, the environment. The two main questions that come out of this are always, what are the environmental concerns that are specific to South Florida from our perspective? Um, we are working with North Carolina and looking at this regionally. So are there transitions or translations of those same concerns? And how do we work with them with North Carolina? Because they're receiving some funding, significant funding uh, over a five-year period to do just this work. So they're taking some of the work that we've done and translating it to where they are. Uh, and also, what are the benefits of implementing renewable energy? If we can start coming off of the reliance on fossil fuels, how is that affecting right now our, our coral reefs, for example? And so really the balance of that is a discussion we need to have in order to understand the big picture and what is acceptable risk. Is it no, uh, no um, impact with sea turtles? Is it some impact? I mean, they're the most endangered species we've got right now, I believe. Uh, but what is an acceptable risk? By not doing anything, not coming off fossil fuel, are we just continuing to enhance the issues and the fallout from that? So we're doing a lot of the work in these areas. And we've got the Lophelia, obviously, uh, with the new CHAPC, um, the sea turtles. And what we're doing right now, we picked to focus on the sea turtles because they are the ones that we know we're going to get the most questions about and we're going to have to address them as we're moving through the program and through the assessment. But there's very little known off the coast of Florida. So we're doing aerial work transects on a monthly basis for sea turtles across this spectrum. And this is from Miami all the way up to just um, below West Palm Beach. But to give you, and this is just one year of data, we're in the process of evaluating it and determining how best to assess the data. So this is what we've seen. These are each single sea turtle observations. OK? The standard protocol is the human element right now. That's accepted protocol for observing sea turtles. But is there a, a direction in this mass of data to say, you might see most of this during the hatching period. And so what does that tell us? Where are we going to look at, from an example, if you were to cite an array of turbines out here, when are you going to conduct your maintenance and overhaul? When are you going to shut down for a period? So you have to start looking at these aspects to help define that answer. Again, this is very new information, um, but we've got scientists here at FAU working on that, as well as graduate students. The importance about this information is there's probably a lot of that information with NOAA already, or different um, scientists, but not about what's happening out here. And if you come back to where we're operating, and I can't pinpoint it on this map, our operational area is going to be about 12 nautical miles from the coast in the Gulf Stream. 
So that's why we're looking at what's happening in this area. Um, we have a number of instruments that we've been working with to define the resource, to understand the potential of it, the strength of the resource, the variability, how much it moves, whether it's moving seasonally, what the effects are. And so we're using what are called acoustic Doppler current profilers. And they tell us the measurements of the resource, its variability um, from a seasonal standpoint. This is March of 09 to roughly about the uh, April of 2010. And you can start seeing the variability. The strength is where you see the heavier current. And so uh, around July, August time frame, you get a perspective that your current is, is stronger at that time frame and also at what depth you're seeing that current. Those uh, acoustic Doppler profilers have been retrieved. We've already deployed two more, but we did just retrieve another profiler that we put out right before Hurricane uh, Irene passed the uh, east of, the, of Florida and the Bahamas to see if we can detect any issues during an extreme event. Luckily, we didn't get hit by the hurricane, but we are st still seeing some perturbations in the data at that time frame. Uh, we also have coastal radar stations that are being set up, which are more the surface measurement of the, of the current. So that is information. The two of those coupled together in a time series will begin to tell us a lot more about the current, its strength, and also um, hopefully we can start inferring with that data the strength of the current with more of a surface detection and not having to uh, expend funds on uh, costly instruments in the water that only have a certain lifetime. For those of you who want to know a little bit about the technology, remember I said this is technology agnostic. Um, it's very much the type of uh, turbine that you would see in wind power generation. Uh, if you were looking at a, a prop plane, you would see that type of technology. It's a single axial turbine. Most of it has been fabricated here in our own shops here at Harbor Branch. Uh, the blades themselves, the rotors, are being uh, fabricated. Uh, it's their composites up in uh, Embry-Riddle, which has a lot, that university has a lot of experience in the aerospace industry. And, so, and also the wind power. They've been working with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory which is doing a lot of on-site testing, on-land testing for wind power generation. Key to all of this is that wherever possible, we have been using simulations, models, software that's been developed and that has been adopted by industry writ large so that our research is not trying to, re or not trying to reinvent the wheel. We need to take advantage of those tools that have been developed, the modeling that's been developed and has been adopted by industry and then build upon it and marinize it, so to speak. Uh, this is going to be important because we want to make sure that there is no new introduction of uh, information and then we spend our, spin our wheels trying to figure out how to make it uh, work for the marine environment. Uh, I mentioned the telemetry buoy. Um, this is my stretch Cadillac. <laughs> uh, we went through a lot of testing, and I've got, where is my, where is Shirley? OK, I can't, I'm not going to hit you. Shirley is one of our key lead engineers. Uh, she spends a lot of time out on the testing and environment. Uh, Jeff Beezer, I think, is not here now. He was here earlier. And uh, so we've got a a core group of engineers and technicians that work across the university who are working together to make sure that this happens. And so uh, we went through some trials and tribulations with the tow test, found out that it was doing a little, what I call diving uh, under tow. So we had to make sure that we had reserve buoyancy because this is going to be sitting out there for about two years. And so that, I think, is going through painting now or may have been 
uh, completed and to make that eco-friendly too. Uh, we have a dynamometer system that will allow us to do testing of the, of the forcing function of the ocean current with and see how uh, the actual generator of the device, or in this case our prototype, operates in a constant current. And now we're adding the data that we acquired both with the acoustic Doppler profilers to show what real world uh, actions are and how is the um, uh, device going to actually operate in those real world conditions. I throw this up here, and I mentioned it before. I came out of the Department of Defense world. Uh, we looked very closely uh, through DOD to understand where technology, where research was in its level of maturity. DOE did not have, Department of Energy did not have this as a thermometer or a barometer, if you will, of measuring uh, the actual maturation of technology and understanding what is the risk in each one of those levels. They have since adopted this. This was developed through NASA and the Department of Defense. And so now researchers, industry folks, the regulators can now speak on the same language level to understand, as well as funders, to understand where technology is from a particular standpoint and is it, has it defined enough risk mitigation through testing and evaluation to really know that it's ready for, say, capital investment at that time. So this is now being used by the Department of Energy and it's being adopted. It, actually, it's been adopted overseas before we even uh, started using this tool at the Department of Energy. They're also putting out uh, different um, notifications of proposals and they're using this to understand which segments of the industry can apply for what proposals based on where they feel their technology has evolved to. Uh, if you look at ocean current, they're mainly in this area, the companies that we've spoken with, and there are over three dozen companies that we have non-disclosure agreements with, and they cut across instrumentation to device design uh, to monitoring systems. Mo if you look at OTEC, actually OTEC was started at about 2000, or back in the 70s, so it's further evolved. And again, it's about the six or seven level if you're going to be operating off of Hawaii, but if you put it in the Gulf Stream, it's probably going to back off a little bit because there's additional testing that needs to be done, mainly of the components. And then the last thing I'll talk about here, and before we have Q&A, if anybody is awake and wants to <laughs> ask anything, um, is our education and our stakeholder engagement. We've developed actually a core curriculum for science teachers at the high school level. We've held, I think it's seven workshops now from all the way from Southern Broward County up to Harbor Branch. We've actually held two of those workshops here at Harbor Branch. We've reached over 200 teachers. These teachers are now taking it into their classrooms with that curriculum and it covers everything from what is energy to the environment to the technology, the interdependencies of those things. And we're adding a seventh topic which is the social aspects, permitting, regulatory process, why that's important why that's a driving function. And as I said, we've reached over 200 teachers. A couple of those teachers have already put in proposals to National Science Foundation, and I believe one just put one in to the Navy to expand on the work that they've learned and how they can take that further into the classroom. It's been very positive. Um, they've learned how to make uh, generators out of a Coke can. How many of you could do that? <laughs> but it has been a very, it's been well received and very positive and it's our way of really beginning to have that dialogue with students before they're going to college to think about marine science, engineering, policy, communication, 
all of these aspects and how they can bring that into what they're dealing with as they go into the university perspective and hopefully engage or encourage more students into those areas. And I know about the 120 miles from north to south on this camp on this campuses because I've traveled it often. And then uh, just to remind you the stakeholder engagement, we've had a number of federal, this is actually Congressman West down at SeaTac and we've had a number of uh, congressmen, senators uh, at the federal level, but also legislators at the state level come in and want to know what's going on and we you know, try to bring them up to speed. And I just gave a, a presentation to the uh, House, the Florida House uh, Energy Committee because they wanted to really understand what does this mean for the state of Florida and economic development. And as I mentioned, we've got a number of companies already uh, poised or working with us to figure out what their needs are and how to take them to the level of testing. Because many of them can be just two people in a, in a garage trying to figure out how to design something and maybe test it in their own pools or off their dock, but that's not going to get them to commercialization. So with that, I'll let it open up for questions. <laughs>